Okay, so this lecture is meant as a bit of an appendix to explain some subtleties of the calculation of the rotational modes. Now, this is going back to the lecture I did on rotational modes, and we saw there, this is rotational modes, of a diatomic molecule and we saw there that you could calculate the partition function as a sum over the single particle energies and I said these were labelled by an integer L from 0 to infinity and there was a degeneracy in the energy levels of 2L plus 1 which meant that the partition function ended up looking like this. Okay, so this is the result we saw in that lecture, but this result is only true for the heterogeneous case. That's where the, the two atoms in the molecule are of different types. And so what I'm going to do now is explain why and what is different for molecules where the two atoms are the same. Okay, so in order to explain this, you need to know a bit more quantum mechanics than I've assumed in the rest of the course. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it and if you don't know all of the things I'm talking about then you um, just need to go and look them up in a quantum mechanics text or maybe when I have time I'll upload some lectures on quantum mechanics as well but not right now. Okay, anyway, so a molecule is, diatomic molecule is composed of two atoms so I can draw simply there's the nucleus of one atom and the nucleus of the other atom and the rotational kinetic energy is mostly the energy associated with these two nuclei rotating around their common center of mass. Now if I call the position of this nucleus R1 and the position of this nucleus R2 and for a very good approximation we can assume these are just point particles, these nuclei, then I can write the wave function psi um, is some function which will depend upon the positions r1 and r2. Okay, And in particular I can write this down as a combination of a function which depends upon the sum of these two, which is basically tracking the centre of mass of the molecule, and another function which is the difference of these two, R1 minus R2. Okay. So in this picture, R1 minus R2 is the vector from R2 to R1, looking like this, this, this vector here is R1 minus R2. There. And therefore, we expect that the rotational information is contained in this function, psi minus, because this is the one which takes a note of the spatial displacement between the two nuclei, whereas this one tracks their common centre of mass. Okay. So the rotational information is in here, so the rotational state is inside this wave function here. Now, I should just make a, a technical note. This is not the most general form of the wave function, psi of R1 and R2. The most general form is a sum of wave functions which look like this. So in general, I have to consider a sum of wave functions which look like this, but okay. for our purposes, it's enough just to consider one of them. Okay, now what we're interested in is the angular momentum and from which you can calculate the angular, uh, the rotational kinetic energy. So to calculate that in quantum mechanics, we need to use the angular momentum operator. Okay, so this is operator L hat squared. Um, so you can write it down in terms of the derivatives of um, x1 minus x2, y1 minus y2, c1 minus c2, if you like, but I don't really care about that. 
what I care about is that the eigenstates of this operator and how they relate to this function psi minus. So the eigenstates are functions which satisfy L hat squared psi minus is some number, they call it lambda, times psi minus. That's the eigenstate equation. And we know here that lambda can only take the values h bar squared L, L plus 1. So this is where the energy levels epsilon L come from. These are the only possible values. And we know that if this is the value, then psi minus is equal to the spherical harmonic wave function, which is usually given the symbol y m l. So, okay. so this is the spherical harmonic functions. Okay, and these are defined by the numbers L, which we've already said are non-negative integers, and these numbers M, which can take any values between minus L going up in units of 1 all the way up to L. Okay. So if you count how many of these M's there are, it turns out there's 12 plus 1 possible values. And it's these which give you the degeneracy 2L plus 1 here in the partition function. Okay, so why is all of this significant? Okay, it's significant because the wave function, in the case that these two particles are the same, has to obey some special properties. Okay, so that's all okay. But um, if we talk now about identical particles, in quantum mechanics, then there are two kinds of particles. Um, we mentioned this briefly in the course. There are bosons and there are fermions. But these particles, this is the part I did not talk about in the course, have different requirements on what the wave function can look like. In particular for bosons, if I have two identical bosons with a wave function R1, R2, and I swap the positions of the two bosons. So that means I consider R2, R1. Then the wave function must be unchanged. So this R1, R2 is equal to this R2, R1. Whereas for fermions, for two identical fermions, the wave function must be multiplied by minus 1 when I swap the two particles. Okay. Now, what influence does that have on the wave function here? Well, you see that if I interchange R1 and R2, then R1 plus R2 doesn't change, right? But R1 minus R2 is changed to R2 minus R1, right? which is multiplied by minus 1. So this is equal to minus R1 minus R2. Okay. So in other words, this interchange of particles in terms of the wave function looking like this leaves this argument looking the same R1 plus R2 looks the same. But this argument, R1 minus R2, is multiplied by minus 1. Okay. Now, if we know that this state is a rotational eigenstate, that means we know psi minus is one of these spherical harmonic functions, then the properties of these spherical harmonic functions are known. So we can ask what happens to these spherical harmonic functions if I replace the argument here by minus the same argument. And the result is
that spherical harmonics obey the following equation. If I have y m l of some vector r, okay, which has fixed length, so it, the spherical harmonics only depend upon the angle of this vector, then this is equal to minus 1 to the power l of y m l of minus r. Okay. So, in other words, so this is a property you can prove just, for example, by directly solving the eigenstate equation of the angular momentum operator and then seeing the properties of the functions. So what this means is that the function is symmetric under this inversion mapping. In other words, yml of r is yml of minus r for even values of L and it's anti-symmetric, that means it's multiplied by minus 1 for the odd values of L. Right, now if you compare that to these conditions that we found for the quantum particles, bosons it should be symmetric and for fermions it should be anti-symmetric. Now that means, it looks like that if these nuclei are bosonic, then we can only have even values of L. Okay? And if these wave functions, if these nuclei are fermionic, then we should only be allowed odd values of L. Okay. So it would be nice if it was that simple, but it turns out it's not that simple in general. Now, there's one case for oxygen the description I've given so far is complete. Okay. So in oxygen, each oxygen nucleus nucleus yeah, is a spin zero particle. So it has zero spin um, and in particular this means it's a boson as well. And the fact that it has zero spin means that there's no spin component of the wave function we need to consider. And this means, as I wrote up here, that we can only have even L values. So therefore, for O2, the partition function Z is modified so that only even values of L are allowed. So L goes from zero to infinity, but we restrict L to even values. Okay, so that the rest of the thing looks the same. Okay, so the wave, the, sorry, the partition function is changed to only allow even values of L. And for oxygen, you get this form of the partition function. Okay, so We'll talk about the effects of this. I'll show you the graph a little bit later on. Okay. Now, for oxygen, this description now is complete, but for other nuclei, it turns out it's a bit more complicated than this because if the nucleus, this is in its ground state at least, if the nucleus has non zero spin, then in the wave function for this diatomic molecule, we have to consider not only the spatial part, the spatial function for the nuclei, but also their spin functions. And this introduces an extra complication. Now I'm going to do the example of hydrogen to talk about this in a bit more detail. Right, so Hydrogen, the nucleus, is just a proton, so that is a spin a half particle and therefore behaves like a fermion. Right, so that means that the wave function must be anti-symmetric under the exchange of particles 
But now, each particle, each nuclei, each nucleus, will have a spatial part of the wave function and a spin part. So the wave function has a spatial part and a spin part. Okay, so I can write down the whole wave function. Psi of R1, R2 is a spatial part, which as before we can write down as psi plus R1 plus R2 times psi minus R1 minus R2. That's the same, but now we have to multiply by a spin part, which I can write as psi 1 for the first particle which for a spin-half particle can be represented as a two-component vector. And then, same again, psi 2 for the second particle. Okay. Now, the reason this is a bit more complicated in the case of oxygen is because the requirement I have from the fermionic nature of these particles is that psi if I exchange particle number 2 with particle number 1, then this should be multiplied by minus 1. But I now have a choice about where this minus 1 factor can appear. It can appear in the spatial part, that means appearing in the function sign minus here, which from here means that these spherical harmonics must only have odd values of L. But it can also appear in the spin part. In other words, exchanging 1 and 2 in the spin part of the wave function could give me the minus sign, in which case I want the spatial part to give a plus sign. In other words, I want the spatial part to have even values of L. So for hydrogen, there are two cases. Either the spin part of the wave function is symmetric, in which case the spatial part is anti-symmetric and I have odd values of L, or the spin part of the wave function is anti-symmetric, in which part, case the spatial part should be symmetric, and I only have even values of L. So to completely understand this problem, we have to work out what are the possible symmetric and anti-symmetric spin states for these two hydrogen nuclei. Okay, so let's do that now. Okay, so they spin a half, so I can represent the spin of the first particle as spin up and or spin down. So the first particle could be up or spin down. And the second particle can also be spin up or spin down. So therefore I can represent the possible spin states. They are form a four-dimensional space of states. So first part, both particles can be up, first particle up and second particle. Sorry, first particle down, second particle up. Or I can have the first particle down and the second particle up. Oh, sorry, that's the same as that one. First particle down and the second particle down. Or I can have the first particle up and the second particle down. So there are these four possible spin states. And we need to make from these combinations which are either symmetric or anti-symmetric under the exchange of the particles, the position here. Okay, so the anti-symmetric combination. Okay, there's only one of these, and it's called the spin singlet. And in terms of these basis states, it's one over square root two. That's just a normalization factor. First one up, second one down, minus second one, sorry, first one down, second one up. Okay. So you can see here in this wave function, if I exchange the order of the spins, then this term becomes this term, and this term becomes this term. And because of the minus sign, the whole wave function is multiplied by minus one. So therefore, this is an anti-symmetric state. Okay. Now for the symmetric states, 
we actually have three of them, and this therefore is called the spin triplet state. So these symmetric states are simply the one where both particles are up, and there's simply one where both particles are down, right? These are obviously symmetric, because if I exchange the order, nothing happens. But they also have a symmetric combination which looks a bit similar to this, where instead of minus, I have plus. So this one. Up, down, plus, down, up. And you can see that exchanging the order of the spins here does not change the wave function. So this is symmetric. Okay. So the spin part of the wave function can be anti-symmetric or symmetric. There are three different ways it can be symmetric. So this corresponds to three different microstates in the canonical ensemble. And there's one way at which it can be anti-symmetric. So that's one microstate in the canonical ensemble. Right, so here, if the spin part of the wave function is anti-symmetric, then we need that the spatial part, so that's psi minus r1 minus r2, should be symmetric, because I want an overall minus sign. So if I get a minus sign from here, I should get a plus sign from here. Right? And that means that we only allow even values of L, because these correspond to the spherical harmonic functions, which are symmetric under inversion. Now, in, and in this case, the spin part of the function is symmetric, which means that we need the spatial part of the function to be anti-symmetric. Okay. And therefore, only the odd values of L are allowed. Okay. So now we can write down the partition function for hydrogen. Okay. So let me go through it slowly. So Z of T is the sum over microstates, or sum over single particle energy states, um, with their energies, which, which has not changed. That's still epsilon L, right? But first of all, there are two possibilities. We can have even L corresponding to the spin singlet. So let's do that first. So that's the sum L goes from 0 to infinity, where L is even. Okay, and there, there is one spin state only, and the degeneracy of the YLM, the spherical harmonics, is 2L plus 1. Okay, so that gives us this term in the partition function, but then we now have to add on the case of the anti-symmetric states. So this is L goes from 0 to infinity with L odd. And for the anti-symmetric states, there is a choice of three spin states. So that means each spatial state here corresponds to three states, including the spin states there. So that means we have to multiply by a factor of three because of the three spin states. So these three spin states give me a factor of three here. And the degeneracy is not changed, so it's still 2L plus 1 times e to the minus epsilon L over kBT. Okay, and all of that to the power n. So you see that the partition function has changed. If you compare this to the one that we found for the heterogeneous molecules, that's this one, you see it's not the same, right? We've split the sum into even part and odd part, and the odd part is multiplied by a factor of 3. Okay, so this is the equilibrium result. Okay. So this is the case where the spin states themselves are in equilibrium. So this is equilibrium. Spin states. Okay. However, it, it turns out that these spin states 
only change very slowly. So in order to change the spin of the nucleus, you need to have some kind of magnetic field um, with which it can interact. And these, in given environment, may be difficult to find. And therefore, if you were to prepare a state of hydrogen only in, say, the spin singlet state, then although at equilibrium it would be a mixture of both kinds of states, this equilibrium takes a long time to establish. And therefore it's useful to talk about what does the partition function look like in the case that all of the hydrogen molecules are in the spin singlet state, or what does the partition function look like if all of the molecules are in the spin triplet state. Okay. So there's some terminology which is worth stating here. The first is that if the hydrogen nuclei are in the spin singlet state, then this is referred to as para-hydrogen. So para-hydrogen means that the nuclei are in the spin singlet state. And the other one, where it's in the spin triplet state, is known as orthohydrogen. Okay, um, and we can also give the partition functions for these as well. Basically, it's either only this term for parahydrogen because then we need the symmetric part only. And for orthohydrogen, we only need the odd part, which gives you this. Right? So for parahydrogen, we get a partition function, which only includes the even sum. And for orthohydrogen, we only get a sum including the odd part. Okay, and the factor of 3 is still there. Factor of 3 doesn't make much difference here, actually. But better include it. Okay, so that's a pretty much discrete, complete description of what you get for hydrogen, then. If the spin states of the nuclei are in the equilibrium configuration, then the partition function is given by this. If, and you can do this experimentally, you arrange it so all of the spin states are in the singlet state, then the partition function is given by this. And if you arrange it so all of the nuclei are in the orth ortho state, then you get the partition function given by this. Okay. So you can ask them, well, what do these what effects does this have on the heat capacity? Okay, and our approximations we did last time are not good enough to show the differences, but you can get a computer to evaluate these sums. So I got a computer to evaluate these sums up to about L equals 100, which gives you a pretty good picture. And this is the result. So what is shown here is how does the heat capacity of hydrogen the rotational modes only, of course, of the hydrogen molecule depend upon temperature for the different configurations. Okay, So you should compare this to the case of the um, the case of the heterogeneous molecules where the shape looks something like this. It goes up, it's got a peak on it and goes duck down to one. So that was the result for the hetero genius molecules. So let's first look at the equilibrium configuration. So this is where you include both para and ortho hydrogen. This gives you the blue curve here. So you can see it has a very significant peak in the heat capacity at low temperatures. This is in Kelvin down here. So this is about what 50 Kelvin. There's a strong peak in the heat capacity. Um, it then decreases. It actually kind of overshoots and goes below one again before rising up to meet one, which it must do in the classical limit, right, to be consistent with the equipartition theorem. 
You also have this result in yellow for the para hydrogen, that's if all the nuclei are in the spin singlet state, and this, what colour is this, I don't know, this purplish line for the case of ortho hydrogen, that's if all of the nuclei are in the spin triplet state. Okay, so you can see that these graphs are all different and this is something you can experimentally verify. And one thing which is interesting to note is that even at room temperatures, which is about 30, 300 Kelvin, sorry, the graphs are all significantly different. So this is important to note because usually when we talk about quantum phenomena we think that these are things which you can only see either at very low temperatures or in small systems of maybe one or two particles. But what this result shows is that these quantum effects actually are observable in, on the macroscopic scale. They are observable in a macroscopic system like a gas. If I take a gas of hydrogen and I measure its heat capacity as a function of temperature, then the graphs are different depending upon the spin states, the quantum states of the nuclei, which depend upon the bosonic, sorry, the fermionic nature of the hydrogen nuclei. And if I do the same graph for oxygen, then you find again the shape of the heat capacity graph for oxygen also depends upon the fact that the oxygen nuclei are bosonic in character. And these are effects which you can see in a macroscopic gas at quite high temperatures. And it's, it's interesting, I think, that our preconceptions that quantum effects are only observable in at low temperatures in small systems are not correct. This is an example where you can observe directly the influence of the bosonic or fermionic nature of the particles at quite high temperatures and in large-scale systems. Right, so that's, I think, all I want to say. I think I've explained all of the important uh, concepts in terms of the how does the quantum statistics affect the rotational mode. So just to summarize, if the two nuclei are the same, then the wave function has to have the correct symmetry under the swapping of the positions of the particles. And this implies some restrictions on what the wave function can look like, which in turn implies some restrictions on the possible values of L, which for nuclei with spin not equal to zero like hydrogen, these restrictions can depend upon the nuclear spin state of the molecule. Okay, so that's all I wanted to add.